unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I'm excited to make good on a sermon that I promised to preach. And today, I feel the grace and intuition in the spirit to share. One day, I made a sentence, a statement, and I said, some people... Do not know how to deal with greatness. Some people do not know how to react to greatness. Some people do not understand how to respond to great things. Some people do not know how to stand before greatness. Some people do not know how to invite greatness. Some people do not know how to entice great things. Some people do not know how to attract and grow with greatness. They do not know how to deal. I'm going to talk about greatness. It's in all aspects. I'm talking about, for example, financial. There are people who are greatly wealthy. But when we're talking about the anointing, there are people who are greatly anointed. Whichever aspect you want to talk about and wherever you will want to define greatness, if you can see the seed, the form, the substance, the matter, the very essence of it somewhere, how do you deal? How do you respond? How do you react to it? Because I have seen by experience that because some people do not know how to respond, how to deal with greatness, many of them cannot be invited into that greatness. They cannot attract that greatness. There's a law of attraction in these things. You must know how to deal before great men. You must know how to stand before kings. You must know how to stand before the people who have the ability to elevate you. The Bible is clear that eunuchs are born. Some are made of men, eunuchs. And the Bible says, and some make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. There are things you're born with that consecrate you before God and give you a distinctive mark before men. But there are things also that you receive from people. God has ordained certain people, men and women in this world, for your sake. That's why you hear the common adage that no man is an island. But they seek really to imply that God has anointed certain people. He has appointed certain people. He has set before certain individuals there for your promotion. Like it is that Satan can set people for your falling. Uh, Satan can set people for your destruction. Satan can send people to frustrate your destiny. God as well has put certain people in your life, in your destiny, in your story. And it's through and by these people that God knows that your promotion will come, your elevation will come, your next story, the thing that will change the trajectory of your life as we know it is in the hands of certain individuals. And to know that is to understand the ways of the Spirit. Is to understand the ways of the Spirit. Elisha was a normal man, very normal fellow. In fact, Elisha was among the 7,000. So when God tells Elijah that there are 7,000 which have not bowed their heads and do bow, Elisha was among the 7,000. And he would have stayed hidden in the 7,000 because, as we will all know it, never knew the names of the 7,000. But Elijah was a man of distinction in his time. The Bible says he was the chariot and horseman of Israel thereof. So in his going, you hear Elisha screaming, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That means when you had Elijah in a nation, you did not need an army. You did not need an army. He was the defense of the whole nation. The security of a people was based on that man's anointing. And whether Israel know it in their days or not, or whether they had faith in their horses and chariots, in their armies and skills, what we see for a fact spiritually 
is when Elisha can interpret the grace and glory that was functioning on Elijah. Oh yes, there were 7,000 prophets that were hidden, of which Elijah never knew about. Although the church uses those 7,000 to justify a certain consecration, a uniqueness that hides them, even when Jezebel is pursuing them, there's also a problem to this, that they are hidden. They are hidden. And because they are hidden, there is a frustration in purpose. The question is, did they leave out their full purpose and plan concerning their lives? Those are things we'll live to know one day. So maybe, just maybe, they would have done better if they knew who Elijah was. But they come to Elisha, oh, you know the Lord is taking your master. Your master. The awakening spiritually happens when Elijah finally is gone. And Elisha parts the sea. And the Bible says, and they come and all bow to Elisha. And they say, truly, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon him. But you see, the sons of the prophets did not know who Elijah really was in that nation. At first, he appeared only to be the master of Elisha. That's all he was. That's why I say that there is no true owner. It's a fake owner. It's a phony owner. That which does not know exactly who they honor and understand who they really are. So the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due, custom to whom custom is due, praise to whom praise is due, and fear to whom fear is due. You must understand the person to whom you honor first. Otherwise, it's fake. It's phony. It's something you're just doing to please people. You don't have a revelation of why you honor who you honor. So, when we look at Elijah in his times, the sons of the prophets just thought he was just simply the master of Elisha. It's only in that consecration, it's only in that ascension that the epiphany comes to them. The revelation finally hits their spirits and they're like, oh my God, this guy was not just a prophet. There was something distinctive about him. And that also, the same spirit that was at work with Elijah is now seated on Elisha. They could not bow to Elijah, but they bowed to Elisha because they did not design. Elisha would have been an ordinary man, except one man came and cast a mantle on him. Pam. Oh, can I go and say bye to my parents? Go, for you know not what has been done unto thee. Then he changes his mind, does whatever has to be done, and then he follows this man because he has understood who this man is. Elisha would have died a normal man, even in his anointing as a prophet. Timothy was a normal fellow, born of a Greek father, Jewish mother. Yes, there was a faith in the grandmother and the mother, but that's it. That was all there was with Timothy. But he encountered a man called Paul. Lot was a normal man. But when the Lord calls Abraham, Lot follows Abraham. And the Bible says, and when Abraham increased, Lot increased also. Lot increased also. So yes, God had sent blessing on the Jew. But the destiny of Lot was to be defined by Abraham. And for him to know was going to be the change of his story. It was going to be the distinctive difference. And so... Some eunuchs, or eunuchs are made of men as well. They're made of men as well. And yes, there are also parts in you, the Bible says, for which you separate yourself for the sake of the kingdom. So I believe that in our space of consecration, right from our mother's womb, the people will encounter, and the things we will do, all of those are pivotal in defining where we finish in this life. In defining where we finish in this life. So, when we say, Lord Abraham, it's not just enough to say that he followed Abraham. There are things that Lot needed to know to connect to the grace that was working on Abraham. Because not all in the household of Terah moved in the blessing that settled on Abraham. God knew Abraham and had a relationship with Abraham. So for Lot to know how to relate with Abraham was a different thing. That's why when he tells him later and the success has come, he says, you know what? Choose yourself a place to go. And I'll stay wherever I will have to stay because our people should not contend over wealth. The scriptures tell us that Lot chose the most fertile plains of Mamre. 
And that's why he chose to settle. But the Bible says, but the Lord stayed with Abraham. And guess what? When calamity came, when war came, when judgment came, it fell where a lot had picked. We see later Abraham trying to fight even to rescue Lot. Because Lot needed what was on Abraham. So to know how to deal. When you stand before kings, how do you stand? How do you relate with people who are able to promote you? How do you deal with people who have a grace on their lives that they just simply need to speak a word and heaven will hear them? How do you deal with the Lord's anointed? If you know that God has anointed a man or a woman for a cost bigger than you have, how do you deal with them? And those are some of the things that I want to share with you, some of the things that I want to demystify for you. Proverbs, the 25th chapter, the 6th verse, if you will read it from the Amplified Bible. The Bible says, Be not forward. Be not self-assertive and boastfully ambitious in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. Stand not in the place of great men. The seventh verse says, For better it is that you should be said to you, Come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whose eyes have seen you. The prince whose eyes have seen you. Let me elucidate. When the Bible says, do not be self-assertive and boastfully ambitious before a king, it's saying, if you're standing before someone who you know is more anointed than you are, who you know is wiser than you are, who you know is richer than you are, who you know is greater than you are, who you know understands and has experienced more than you are. The Bible says the biggest mistake you would do is to stand in the presence of that person boastfully ambitious, forward, self-assertive. I'll give you an example. So a king is saying, oh, let me explain to you the glories of the kingdom and the victories we have had with kingdoms. He's explaining. And as he's explaining the victories they've had with kingdoms, you're also in there, you know, sliding down your boast and ambitions as well and your victories too. So as he's saying, you know, when we went north, we fought 20,000 people. Ah, ah, wait, it reminds me the time when two people attacked me, you are interrupting a conversation of greatness testifying before you. Because you don't understand that when a king is testifying before you, they're imparting something. They don't need your testimony. You're killing two people and this man is killing 20,000. And he's educating your spirit. He's not only speaking, no, he's opening your eyes to see by the spirit and catch where he is spiritually. And you're here also Pushing your ambitions and interests. Seeking to impress. You're seeking to impress. Spiritually, the seed of greatness is frustrated. Because every time you stand before one bigger, you stand before them to catch a vision bigger than you are. And if you know that you're seeking for a vision bigger than you are, then humble yourself before that vision. I have seen people who talk too much in the presence of people who know better than them. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the business. I've seen it in the ministry. You're standing before a man who is pastoring 50,000 members. He is discussing ministry in the presence of six people. You're pastoring 12 members. And you're speaking the most. Because you think this guy with 50,000 needs your wisdom. He doesn't. If he did, he would look for you. He would look for you. But you must have the wisdom to know, to discern, that destiny has sort of aligned you before greatness because there is an impartation God wants to put into your story. You're at your workplace. Your MD is speaking and you're speaking over them. Your boss is speaking and you're speaking over them. You're trying to impose yourself as to show that you know way more. You are more assertive than they are. That's foolish. That's not how you relate with greatness. What if greatness rebukes you? How do you react when greatness rebukes you? If you ever receive a rebuke or a correction from anybody or anything that you know is greater, understand that it's inviting you 
into a deeper responsibility to its end. I think some of you at your workplaces, you answer your bosses like they're your peers. You answer your pastors like they're your peers in your church. How? And you're the same person who aspires to be a great minister. You're the same person who aspires to be a great business person. But you're frustrating the office that you are serving and aspiring to get into. And it's the same heart telling God that he wants to be promoted in that same office. How? You can never, never be elevated into something that you don't own and respect. It doesn't happen that way. And that's why also in the seventh verse it says, it is better that you should be invited to the presence of great men. No, when you come in a meeting, look for a place where you should sit. Don't have a deceived mentality of who you want, where you really belong. And then just march on to the place where you think, I think I deserve, or I think I belong here. No, that's not faith. That's foolishness. Because faith works with wisdom. I've seen folk who in the mind of faith have actually lost a strand of wisdom. And I wonder, how does that even work? Because wisdom actually is the principal thing, should be the principal thing. Before you speak of a faith, you must speak of a wisdom. In God. Because that's the foundation with wisdom. A house is built. And understanding is established. And with knowledge, the house is filled with all increase and precious, pleasant riches. See? So, you find a person. You've come into a meeting. Sit anywhere. Be invited by greatness. When the seventh verse insists and says that rather than being sent back, and put lower in the presence of the prince whose eyes have seen you. It means that if greatness has observed you elevating yourself before you have paid your dues, or before the world has responded to you, there's something it teaches a man who is great when they observe you. From then on, they will never look at you as one who respects the places of greatness. Let them invite you to that space. I've been at parties, and we go there. And then you hear a man of God say, hey, you must call me. I must speak. I must speak. There are many great people here. I must speak. Why? Because he feels that spiritually, if they call him, it will elevate him to the spaces of greatness. That is insecure. That is insecure. You're dealing with insecurity as a man of God. If you ever look to anything, kind of, anything that is outward, to elevate you spiritually, and you're really a man of God, then I want you to understand you are insecure. And wherever insecurity is, is a spirit of fear. You don't get it, but there's something wrong with you. So, if we read this, for example, and I love this verse, there's something that if you read the very word, uh, Proverbs 25, verse 6, if you read it in the New Living Translation, it also brings another meaning that I think is also a lesson. The Bible says in the New Living Translation, it says, do not demand an audience with a king or push for a place among the great. Do not demand. Do not demand. The seventh verse says, it is better to wait for an invitation to the head table than to be sent away in public distress. But let me emphasize, do not demand an audience with greatness. Don't. Let me give you an example. I want to meet the president. Take me to the president. What for? I just want to meet the president. Why do you want to meet the president? I just want to meet him. Why? Now, because you feel that you're a man or a woman of God. And you feel that those who probably have met the presidents of this world or the kings of this world probably have also attained a certain status. And you think, huh, for me to have a status, I need to shake the hand of a leader. I need to be seen in a picture with the hand of a king. I need to be seen standing next to the director of so-and-so. Take me. Please, take me there. Please, take me. No, the Bible says, that's wrong. Do not demand an audience with greatness. Oh, some people teach it the wrong way. They say, ah, no, you know, if you don't fight, you'll not get there. The kingdom of God, since the days of John the Baptist, suffered violence. And them which are violent, they take it by force. And so what you do, when you find a person who is great and you need him, press your way, press your way. No, the Bible says do not invite yourself. Do not seek audience with the king. Don't. If you know that some is greater than you, don't seek its audience. 
Because there's another way to do it. There's another way to do it. And if you miss that process, and you take yourself in spaces where God does not want you to go, you can only produce carnal results. You'll not really change and do what God wants you to do in that time and season. So it's okay if the king never invites you. It's okay if the MD of so-and-so never gets you. It's okay if a particular leader never recognizes you. You should feel fine. Why? Because God is with you. He has not left you. You must get to the level of understanding that God wants you only in the places where your purpose should be given, should be attained, should be attended. If God has not invited you in a certain place, no matter how much feeling of missing out or more you feel, don't ever be tempted to think that you belong or should belong and push yourself in spaces where you think you should belong. Let God pave way for you to invite you in the places you must go. I've stood before big people. I've stood in places and none of those places have I ever invited myself. Have I ever sought or demanded an audience? In fact, they have pleaded with me to stand in certain places. But I've spoken before the greatest. I have stood in houses and places that people can never imagine I have been to. I have conversations with people, some people only dream to see once in their lifetime. And I have never once pushed myself for the audience. God has a way of introducing you in the places you must stand. And guess what? If God introduces you in the place you must stand, it doesn't matter how many people are around you and how great they are, he will always give you a certain authority in the spirit that goes beyond the words that you could ever speak with your own mouth. That is the way of the spirit. That is the way of the spirit. So you tell me, so if I want to do this, if I want to be among the great, if I want to be recognized, if I want to be, the, but I cannot, and you've told me, the scriptures are telling me I should not demand audience. I should not seek an invitation. How come I was not invited to this? How come I was not invited? How come you were not invited? Oh, let me even tell you this. There are times we are even invited for certain things which are so big by standard, certain men of God would kill for. And we don't go in those places. Why? Because the Spirit tells you, even though the invitation is come, I don't want you there. I don't want you there. You say, okay, Holy Spirit. And you obey the voice of God. Are you hearing me? Now, so you say, how am I then to do it? Simple. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 16, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. A man's gift. Your gift should introduce you. Your gift should introduce you. That's why I say, if your gift is not enough to introduce you before anybody, it doesn't matter how good you think you are. If your gift is not big enough to bring you, to invite you, to connect you to greatness, you don't need to step in those places. You don't need to. But you see, when you read that, you see that in there also, God is giving you an answer. He's telling you, instead of seeking for audience with great men, churn your gift. Instead of seeking for greatness with great men, attend to your talent and gifting. Instead of seeking for attention from greatness, amend your story and skill. Sharpen it and prune it. Do the working so good study that you might be showed or proved to be a worker that accurately devise the word of truth that you might not need to be ashamed. Because the shame sometimes does not come only in the words that you speak, but it comes in the places where you are weighed and found wanting, where you're standing. And before you know that, they say, you know what? I think we rushed to put this person here. I think we rushed to invite this man here. I think we were wrong to invite this individual here. Let us never invite him again on this altar. Let us never call him again into this fold. Let us never seek any attention concerning these things because it seems he was not ready. He was not able. He did not have the ability. He did not have the integrity. He did not have the wisdom. He did not have the maturity 
for this place. Why? Because the prince has seen you. Greatness has seen you. So the Bible speaks of the eyes of greatness. It means the eyes of greatness weigh. They can weigh you. You are allowed to judge any dimension lower than you. Spiritually. If you're in the fourth dimension, you can judge the third and second and first. If you're in the fifth dimension, you can judge the fourth, third, second and first. If you're in the first dimension, you can't judge the second dimension. If you're in the second dimension of the spirit, you can judge the first dimension. So if a man is greater than you, there's something in God that allows them to even judge you where you are. So the eyes of greatness are allowed to judge in the spirit realm. And some of you are not paying just the price of the devil attacking you on Tuesday. But you're paying the price of greatness judging you. It doesn't need to speak. It just needs to have an opinion about you in its heart. And if it does, you are in trouble. Because maybe, just maybe, it's your door. It's the only door God has set in that time. It's the door that you need. Or if another cycle of the Spirit should come to open another door for you, you will have to be delayed because you did not know how to enter the door you were supposed to enter in the season that God appointed for you. So churn your gifting. Invest in your talent. Improve your craft. Work hard. Read. Invest time in the things that really matter. It doesn't matter whether they recognize you now or tomorrow or they don't. One day they will recognize you. One day they will recognize you. One day they will recognize you. I can tell you, for example, many of the media houses where now we air our services, we didn't go to them. No. But they recognized something with us. And they invited us into their spaces, of which we have received with honor and grace. We treat them with respect because we honor whatever God sets in our lives to grow us. I tell people, you must learn not only to reward, but to honor whatever grows you or anybody that grows you. Because there are people in this world who will take from you and will continue taking from you until one time you wake up and you have nothing. So if anything or anybody is set before you and you know they grow you, you understand, you know they elevate you. If you're in school, do you thank your teacher? If you're in university, do you walk to your lecturer and tell them, thank you for teaching us? Oh, ah, he's paid. He's paid a salary. Yes, but the things he's giving you or she will give you that are beyond the salary. They're beyond the wages that they're paid or salaries that they're paid. And to understand that, and I remember God told me that years ago, many years ago, even in university. I used to walk to my university professors. And I would tell them, thank you for teaching us. And I don't seek, oh, can I give you my number? Or oh, can we meet tomorrow? You know, I'm thank- no, 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 no. Thank you for teaching us. And I walk away because I don't need their attention. But it's relevant in my story. It's my responsibility. It's incumbent on my heart to make sure that I do what God requires of me in the time it is required of. Because in there is the honor of the Spirit. It's the humility of the Spirit. It's out of that humility that God exalts men. There's no other way. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, star your gift. Star your gift. Just star it. Because he says that's the only thing that will make room and invite you. That means God has placed in you the thing that greatness needs to catch attention of. You only need to know how to star that thing. How to make your star bright. Hallelujah, glory to God. Hallelujah, glory to God. Now, let me give you a few examples in scripture. Abraham and his wife were barren. They did not have a child for many years. And God had a mind of giving Abraham a son. And Isaac was more than just a son. He was more than just having a son. He was the preservation of the posterity of that purity and line. Because these were the patriarchs. This is the story and the lineage, the genealogy that ushers our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ later in the story as we read in Matthew. He is going to father all that shall believe, not only by blood, but through faith. 
So, the Bible says in Genesis, the 18th chapter, he lifted up his eyes, Abraham, and looked and lo, three men stood by him. And the Bible says, and when he saw them, he ran to them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now, you'll say, what did he see? There were three men. That's what the Bible calls them, three men. But really, there were angels. And Abraham discerned that the men that he was seeing afar were not ordinary people. When your heart is humble, it sees the things it must see spiritually. Some of you, the things that should elevate you, build you, promote you, you have overlooked and have not seen with the right vision of the Spirit because there is pride in your heart. That's why you need the humility of the Spirit. That's why the Bible speaks of how the humble shall see God. It's the humility of the Spirit. I'm not just talking about the outward temperament. I'm talking about that cultivated humility of the Spirit. There's a vision it will give you because when you are humble in the Spirit, you are so designing and sensitive to anything or anybody that is available in the Spirit for your promotion. And you know how to respond and react before them. You know how to. I found a, a woman of God once, and we were in public. And the Lord told me something about this woman that I knew I don't think anybody in that room designed. And of course, I'm anointed, I'm apostle grace. And the Spirit of the Lord tells me, go and kneel before that woman. And I said, okay. So I walked, and I knelt before this woman to greet her. Oh, no, Apostle Grace, no, don't kneel before me. You can't do that. How can you do that? No, Apostle, no, no, no you don't need to do that. I just want to know, I have to do it. I think she did not know why or from where I came to do that. Because I think it was a strange thing knowing me. She knew I'm a man of God. She honors what's upon my life. But that was the instruction. And of course, it looked so sad in our eyes that I was honoring her that way. But spiritually, there was something God had instructed me to do. He told me, it's only by doing this that I'll take you to the next level. I said, just seconds of going on my knees to own an anointing. I said, yes, and I did it. Of course, she fought with it in her heart. And I know why she fought with it in her heart. But the voice kept telling me, this is what I do. I exalt the humble. It's not just what we do in humility. It's the eyes that see what they must see for our sake. For our sake. But I would have been proud. I said, no, no, I don't need to. She knows me. I'm a man of God. I don't need to. I don't need to. I don't need to. Oh, we have done many things of that matter. And I don't really give a damn what people think about me. Because it's not really in what you interpret concerning my life. It's what God tells me I am before him. And for me, that matters most. Nothing else. Nothing else. So, the humble spirit in Abraham could see that the three men that were standing before him were not just men. They were angels. And that is why later when the Bible says, when you entertain strangers, you know, treat them with courtesy, kindness, and common decency, for amidsty are angels. If somebody is ushering in the church, have you read that scripture? Have you understood that in the entertaining of our strangers, sometimes the angelics come in and you are unaware? But here I say this, that if you are humble by the spirit, you can discern that the person who has entered that house is not just a mere man, but he's angelic. But God is saying, even in the places where you could miss it because of your indifference, at least take the simplest principle that when strangers walk into your church, when strangers walk to you, entertain them with humility, with a sense of decency, because you never know you'd be entertaining an angelic. Some of us are not struggling in life because we did this so that the devil has issues with us, but simply because we closed the doors that God had sent before us because they came strange. They came with a cloak of strangeness. And we could not relate with them because they were strange. We only want to connect to that which is predictable and familiar with our own areas and angles of perceiving things. That's how we lose it. 
if Abraham had looked at these three men and simply thought that they were just men, he would have sought God for another 20 or more, 30 or 40 years looking for a child, or perhaps even died without a child. Some people think, no, if God has ordained you eh, that you will do this, it's a must, you will do it. No, no, that's not true. That's not true. It ain't mean that because God has called you to revive a nation, it means that it is automatic that it must happen because God has said that you're going to do it. That's not how it works. Moses was called by God to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh. That was a calling. God had appeared to him in a burning bush, but he was going to slay him except Zipporah came through. This was a man called by God to deliver a whole nation. But because he had broken a certain principle, God was going to kill him until Zipporah came through and circumcised the boy. And that's how Moses' life was preserved. Yet, he was called by God. So you could think, oh, you know, because he has a big calling and he has to do something in Egypt, God is going to ignore this. Uh-uh. No. It's not just enough. It's not just enough. Yes, the giftings, the assignments of God are on our life, but it's not enough for us to assume that because they are on our lives, therefore, we should not discipline ourselves spiritually. That's a wrong way of understanding the will of the Spirit. God requires that discipline. And if you're out of discipline, you repent and get to the right order because he allows that repentance to change of mind, metanoia. So the Bible says, when he sees that this was greatness, what does he do? He doesn't even know what they're going to give him, but he only senses that the guys that are before me have something on their lives that I don't have, and I feel that they have the ability to promote me to the next level. What does he do? He doesn't wave. He doesn't send his servants to them. The Bible says he runs toward them to meet them. And the Bible says he bows himself towards them. And the Bible says, it says, My Lord, if I found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray thee, for thy servant. Let a little water, I pray thee, be fetched thee, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. So he invites them, and the Bible says, he fetched a morsel of bread, and comforted their hearts. And the Bible says, and as they were eating, as they stood under the tree to eat, the Bible says, he stood by them watching as they were eating. He did not even sit down to sit with them. I don't know, guys, you're welcome. Come on, come into my house. Yeah, yeah, you're good. I know you're sent by God, by the your angels, eh? Uh-huh. Bring food, eh? I want them to test this, okay? Put it on the table. Let's sit together. Let's start eating. No. Sometimes you even must know what you ought not to eat. The Bible speaks of how we ought not to eat with certain people. The Bible speaks of how certain people don't have a right to eat on certain altars. That's what the Bible says. So the Bible says he invites them, put some muzzle of meat, a fine meal, cakes are brought, and the Bible says he fetched a calf, tend and good, gave it to the young man. He slaughtered it. He took butter and milk and the calf. He dressed them, set it before them. And the next line says in the eighth verse, he stood by them under a tree as they ate. This is the patriarch, our father, standing before greatness, refusing to even join their meal because they are his promotion. Lest he error while he's eating, lest he speaks something or even assumes that he's familiar with them in that process and lose the bigger picture. What does he do? He is compelled by the spirit that is telling him he's going to be promoted to a greatness. God is inviting him to a certain seed of greatness. The impartation is only for a moment. He just stands by them like a waiter. And he does this. He's waiting. Is there anything you need? Do you need more sugar, more salt? Can I bring more water? Why is he standing guard? To make sure that they will not want anything. And he sends for a servant. Abraham wants to bring that food himself because he knows what he's seeking for. And when the men are full, what happens? They speak into his destiny. The same men go to Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole city is destroyed because they did not discern the salvation that came with three people. Know how to stand before greatness. Know how to. Know how to. If we go back to the story of Elijah and Elisha, the Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 12, as Elijah is going up, Elisha sees him. The Bible says, he cries and cries, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horseman thereof. And the Bible says, and he saw him no more. But remember, Elijah had told Elisha that if you want to receive a double portion of what is upon me, now double portion, they mean two times the anointing because in the Jewish culture, double portion means the portion that should come for the son who comes first. 
for the son who comes first. Every man of the spirit knows the son who comes first. And their blessing and impartation is different from anybody that follows after. That is why Paul had Timothy. Yet there were many, but he had Timothy. You see that? So, to know how to attract a mantle bigger than you, to know how to respond to that cloak of responsibility that is bigger than where you are, or that you could have not even had an opportunity to tap in this life of men. A man comes and tells you, come on my altar and minister. He's honoring you. He doesn't need you. He's honoring you. But there are some men we invite on our altars because we need them. But there are some people we put on our altars because we are planting a seed of hope in what is in them to tell them this is the only way that you will be exposed to the world. So when you get on a man's altar, know exactly, firstly, are you going because that man needs you to bless him? Or are you going because he is inviting you to greatness? There's a difference. Not everybody who stands on the altar comes to bless the man of God. No. The people we've brought on our altars because God has told us, put this person here because they need you in this time to help nurture their gift to the next level. And there are people God tells us, you know, call this person on your altar because if they speak on your altar, something is going to be elevated concerning your life in the spirit. And that's some of our people don't know the difference. And a guy comes who you are inviting to nurture and he stands on that pulpit like he deserves to bless you. Like he's in a position to invite you. No, listen, you're under another man's shed. He's not under your shed. If the sun comes burning, you're only preserved because you're under his shed. You're under his covering, they call it. And then a son walks on the altar, or a daughter walks on the altar in the churches of today. And he speaks as though he's exalted above the father. Or assumes that it is his greatness or her ability that invited her in that space. No. And guess what? Even if you didn't step on that altar, the man or woman has something on his life. And their ministry will grow whether you stand on that altar or not. But you need it. Know who you need and who needs you. That's what I'm trying to say. Know who you need and who needs you. And know how to respond to that order. Some have stepped on great altars. And because they did not have that understanding... God himself carried them off those altars and they might never stand on any altar of even a fraction or a quarter of where God had elevated them because they did not know how to respond to greatness when it invited them for their nurturing. Some of you, your names will never be known except by some men. The world will never know you except by some men. So Elisha knows that there's a double anointing. He's the first ling of Elijah. He says, if you see me go, you'll have it. Scriptures tell us, he sees him taken, he's carried in the spirit, and he cries, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And the Bible says, Elisha took hold of his own clothes and rent them in pieces. He tore his garment. But what happens? He puts on the garment of his father because he could not carry both. He could not carry both. He had a garment as a prophet. But entering into the shoes of Elijah was not just a prophet. He was entering the shoes of a chariot and horseman of Israel. And in that generation, they could only be one. They couldn't be two. They couldn't be three. They could not be four. So what does he do? He has the wisdom. He rents his garment and tears it apart. Why? Why? Because he's trying to say, this thing that I'm entering is bigger than a prophet. The 6,999 that are still prophesying. But what is settling on my life is bigger than anything that they have ever seen. Or what I even had on myself. He removes his garment and puts it down and puts on the garment of Elijah. And so when he crosses, they observe him and they say, Truly, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon him. From then on, he is Elisha functioning in an Elijah anointing. When God is consecrating the sons of Aaron, the Bible says they can only be anointed in the garment of Aaron. 
for them to take on that Levitical responsibility, God could not create their own garment because in that nation they had only to be one high priest. They couldn't be two high priests. They couldn't be three high priests. They could not be four high priests. They could only be one high priest. And he says, and the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him. The Bible says, to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. God could not make another garment for the son of Aaron. He could only anoint them through Aaron's garment. And to seek your own garment in a time when God tells you you can only be anointed in that one is pride. It's the people who are running businesses who think that they would rather be a head of an ant than being a foot of an elephant. That's not wisdom for you to think that you would rather own your own company and do this and be the head of an ant as long as I'm the boss of this. But are you really ready to run a company? No. If you're not, join something bigger than you and serve it. You'll be elevated. You'll be multiplied. You'll do way better than being a head of an ant. Some pastors are running churches. They're not even supposed to be running. If they really had God, they would close those ministries and go and learn again. I'm not saying they were not called. I'm only saying they need to go and learn again because they're not even qualified to be heads over men. But pride. And they cannot even submit to a spiritual authority to be taught because they think they hear God only. And you look at this fellow, 10 years, 20 years, and his ministry is dying. It's dying, but he is even more proud this year than he was two years ago. That's deception. And the grace of greatness is locked up from this man. And he's going to go on a prayer mountain and seek God and fast for 30 years. And he'll never see the answer. Because the answer is not on the mountain. It's somewhere in the principles and patterns of God. You don't build a garment when you're still under a greater garment. You don't. You don't. Because it only means spiritually that you are under and functioning in your little garment by the grace of a garment bigger than you. This is the garment that was smitten on your body. It's the one that you were struck with. It's telling you, follow. This is the thing that you're going to take after. And if Elisha had not understood that, he would have been like any other prophet. He would have been like any other prophet. The scriptures don't tell us that there was some special with Elisha. No, he was just the man on the way when Elijah left the cave after God had rebuked him. He was just the man on the way. And Elijah had a choice to skip him and look for another one and still put a mantle on him. Some people don't get this. Listen, God honors patriarchal impartations that even when he appears to Rebekah, and he tells him that the older shall serve the younger. When Isaac is full of age and he wants to bless, his head tells him, I love Esau. Jacob could not receive the blessing of God as Jacob, even though God had spoken that the older shall serve the younger. Why? Because God respects patriarchal impartation. He respects his servants. So Jacob has to come in as Esau. Isaac has to bless Jacob as though he's blessing Esau. Had he known that this was Jacob in that stead, Jacob would have been cast immediately. Even God could not go beyond patriarchal impartation. He had to work through Rebecca to manipulate a system because the voice of this man, Isaac, must bless his seed. God doesn't break pattern. He's a God of principle. He does not break pattern. He didn't break pattern. So you take heed. You understand. The thing that you're seeking for in God has principles. It has a process. You must know how to do the process. Oh, no. I don't need his blessing. God will bless me. Yeah, of course God will bless you. Of course God will bless you. But you see, newsflash, even in 2020, we are not equal in the spirit. Even in 2040, we will not be equal in the spirit. He says, some are instructors, others are fathers. We are not equal in the spirit. We are not equal in the spirit. We are not equal in the spirit. And no man is irreplaceable in the spirit. Any man can be replaced in the spirit. So to know that wisdom and to know what you must humble yourself into, to know how to submit yourself the right way, 
That is how promotions come. That's why the Bible says he exalted the humble, but he sees the proud from afar. He says, okay, you want to do it your way? Go your way. Your blessing is on a woman's hand. You're ignoring that? Okay, go your way. Oh, because you're in the New Testament, all of us have Jesus. We all have the Holy Spirit. Yes, we all have Jesus, and we all have the Holy Spirit. But when Paul is separated, consecrated in Damascus, he goes to Arabia, comes back in Damascus three years, and the Holy Spirit tells him, even if you have the foundation of the New Testament, and I've given you the grace to lay the foundation as a master builder, even though you're the one I've spoken to, to change the New Testament and take the gospel to the Gentile world, even though three quarters of the New Testament in the future will be you, but I want you to respect the process. The Bible says, it says, and how I went up to Jerusalem to those of reputation to submit the gospel privately to them that they might understand what I'm preaching. And Paul says, lest I should run by any means in vain. Even though he's given the grace to lay the foundation of the New Testament. Even though God has told him that he has seen something nobody in Jerusalem has seen. But God tells him, uh-uh, I respect patriarchal impartations. Go to Jerusalem and submit this message to those which go before you. Because if you don't, Paul, it doesn't matter how deep your revelations are, you will run in vain. The scriptures tell us, even when he received the message as it was, he went to James and Peter in Jerusalem, and he submitted that message to them. He would have said, no, 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 I don't need any of those guys. I don't need them. I don't need them. I don't need them. I have the message. I have the revelation. What do they have? No. He honored them. Because he understood the order of the Spirit. He understood the order of the Spirit. That's why Elisha rents his garment. I'll give you last example. Esther, you know very well the story of a king, Ahasuerus. Or some versions call him success. Any of the two was the same person. And so the scriptures tell us he invites Vashti, his wife, to show her beauty to the world. And Vashti refuses, long and short, whatever she has done. The king calls his wise men. He says, what should we do to this woman? He says, his wise men tell the king that whatever she has done, if it be hard in the kingdom, all the wives of all the men in the kingdom shall rebel against their husbands. Why? Because when you are placed in a, a position of authority, because, for example, being a wife is positional to a man of God. Or being a husband to an anointed woman is positional. But whatever you do can affect, as a man, all the men. And whatever you do as a woman can affect all the women. That's why he's saying that whatever Vashti has done, the wise men are telling her service, if it is hard, it will put a seed of rebellion in all our wives. There are things I could do and damage my generation because I know who I am before God. So, the wise men tell Ahasuerus or Sassus that, you know, let's get you another wife. So they switch. And of course, we know the story how they got of the virgins and then started preparing them for about a year. And then each virgin comes before the king stands. If the king likes, hmm, the king doesn't like. If the king likes, send them to the concubines. If the king doesn't like, send them to that. And so during that time, the Bible speaks in Esther, the second chapter, the 15th verse. Of course, many women were coming, you know. And when they came before the king or greatness, they spoke whatever they spoke and left. Now, if you read from the message version, the Bible says when it was Esther's turn to go to the king, that is Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who adopted her as his daughter. The Bible says she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, Haggai was, you know, the king's butler, the guy in charge of preparing these women for the king to see. The Bible says she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, had recommended. Esther, the Bible says, just as she was, won the admiration of everyone who saw her. She gained favor before everyone. Why? Because when she was going before Haggai, which was a eunuch, the king's keeper, the guy who was in charge of that harem, the Bible tells us that it seems when these women were prepared, they thought that their beauty would smite the king. So they go to greatness with beauty. They present beauty before greatness. And the king says, uh-uh, I'm not interested. Because greatness is not looking for outward temperament. It's not looking for outside beauty. I see that this girl Esther goes to Haggai and asks him, 
if I stand before this man, I might be asked certain questions. How am I supposed to answer? And what am I supposed to ask for? The Bible says distinctively that while every girl went into the king's presence, perhaps was asked questions and she answered them. Esther knew how to answer the king. The Bible says she only answered the way Haggai had told her to answer. Meaning, she consulted with the man who knows the king better to know how the king wants to be answered. Instead of assuming that her beauty would give her a ticket and then create a demand because of her beauty. That's Jezebel. That's Jezebel. That's manipulation. She was not seeking to seduce greatness. She knew that sitting in the office of a queen was more than just seduction. It was more than just beauty. There was something that was needed because her responsibility to the children of Israel was more than just being a queen and a niece of Mordecai. She is the salvation of Israel. She was raised for such a time. Her assignment was bigger than what was being seen initially. So she senses in her that there's a greater responsibility in her spirit and that she's not just going to become queen if she should. There is something bigger for her people. The Bible is clear. In the first place, if you read even earlier, when she goes before Haggai, the Bible says she refuses to introduce herself while every girl was mentioning her family line. I come from so-and-so. My father is this because probably they thought that by introducing their family lines, they would appease Haggai. The eunuch. The Bible says she refused to introduce herself for who she was. Why? Because Mordecai had told her, if you go there, don't introduce yourself. Don't talk about me. Don't talk about your uncles. Don't talk about your cousins. Why? God will promote you by merit. We want it to happen by merit. We want that grace to come by merit. She obeyed Mordecai. When she goes to Haggai, Haggai tells her, when you go before the king, don't ask for this. Don't ask for that. Because she has time to inquire or even listen to the man that understands the heart of the king. And she goes before the king and presents exactly what the man who knew the heart of the king said to her. And the Bible says it's because of that, everyone who saw Esther favored her from that day. It was satisfaction to Haggai that this king had found the right woman after the fall of Vashti. But it was also important to Esther to understand that when she stands before greatness, she must yield to instructions bigger than her personal desire and dream. Because every time you elevate it to greatness, you start to understand that it's not about you. You start to lose the you in the narrative. When you were young, you went with whoever you wanted. But everybody says, when you shall grow up, you shall hold up your hands and another man shall gather you and take you places. You will not do. Because that's maturity. And the more God elevates you, the more you start to see the self die. But if you keep the self in the elevation, you frustrate the spirit of greatness. God has promised through his word that he shall make you great. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. To make you prosper, not to harm you, to give you a future hope and that expected end. God desires the best for you. God is on the side of your success. God is on the side of your promotion. God is on the side of your increase. God is on the side of greatness. He wants to see this in your life. But he's saying, but I have a process. I have principles. I have patterns. There's a way to it. He says, choose my way. Never seek to fight your way if you know that way is going up. It's wisdom to learn how to do whatever has to be done by grace to be carried into those places. Because when you're carried into those places, you will see that it's effortless. You will see that you will not strive. You will see that you will not fight for spaces. I don't care whoever calls me or who doesn't. I don't care whoever invites me or who doesn't. I care for this one thing in this world that I might please my God. If I can do that, the rest is sinking sand. But in the spaces he shall invite me by what is working in me, those I will receive and have received with grace because I'm fully aware that my calling, my course and assignment in this world, my mandate is bigger than me. And every other day as I see myself increase and the ministry grow, I realize that it's no longer about me. 
is about the God who anointed me from my mother's womb. Before anybody knew that I was anointed. And he has plans for you. May you know what to do. Will you raise your voice right now and speak to God? Speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Rinda roko sita la mayaraba ko sharalalaba. Raba zolo broko shire mandoro bro sata la bayaraba ko she. Ma bro zoro bo shara mandoro bo sakata la mayere bo sa. Kamba zolo boko sita la mayaraba ko sata la baye. Rima tolo bro zoro boko shire mandara baza katalapa. Re katala bayara bazolo moko brazele ke tele payaraba. Bo sele mandoro broza katala maho shetele brozolo bo. Kama tolo brozolo mandara baka sinde ho shita la paya. Roko pranda la zakatala boko shele bo. Maso brozo boko shinda la bazalaba. Rika tolo broko santele broza la bayashi. Keri mazoro broza la makaye. Ho shande ze boko setele payaraba. My heart's prayer for you is that may God give you the true understanding of the course with which he has called you and that it's for greatness because the seed of greatness is in thee by faith and may he give you the wisdom to do the process, to execute, to stand before greatness, whether anointed men or women of God, whether wealthy, whether wise, whatever God will bless you. That he will give you the wisdom to know how to stand, serve, yield, respond, entertain greatness. And as you get that wisdom, I see you so higher and higher on the wings of the spirit. And I see things working quicker and faster for you. And there's nothing in the world that can stop you. I bless your bread and water. I bless your substance. My God will lift his countenance on you. He will give you peace. He will preserve you. He will undergird you. He will cradle and instruct you. I speak healing to the sick. Whatever sickness there is, I speak deliverance to them that are bound. I decree and I declare that great days are ahead of you. And thank God for instructing us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we've prayed and believed. Amen. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity. It's not tomorrow, not next week. That's pride. Don't be proud in you to think that you can play it and control the future. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week, but you're certain of today. And in love, God is inviting you to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And if you want to make that prayer, I just want you to repeat these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior and born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. <laughs>